Hi Veritas, I wanted to do a reply to your reply to Das American Atheist's reply to William Lane Craig. Let me start by giving a quick response to one of the early clips from Craig that both you and Das American Atheist cite. In order to recognize that an explanation is the best, you don't need to have an explanation of the explanation. I'm actually going to contend that this is not true, and this is pretty much the heart of the whole debate here. The reason why it's not true is because Craig and you are both using a deeply flawed understanding of how explanations work. You think it's going to lead to an infinite regress problem, for example. Now, I'll say more about this in a bit, but for now, just let me say this. If you don't have at least some vague approximation of an explanation for the explanation, your first explanation cannot be the best explanation because it's not an explanation at all. Answering a riddle with a mystery is not an explanation. There is nothing about giving an explanation of the explanation that tells you anything meaningful about how it best explains the data at hand. Yes, it does. If you're trying to explain some currently unexplained phenomenon, call it X, in terms of another phenomenon, call it Y, but Y is just as mysterious as X, then you haven't moved from a state of not understanding to a state of understanding. You've moved from a state of not understanding to another different state of not understanding. To explain what we don't understand, you need to appeal to what we do understand. The validity of an explanation lies solely in its power to explain. This is what makes an explanation valid. There's, there's nothing about telling you who designed the designer that makes the fact that a designer is the best explanation for this set of facts meaningful. And this is precisely the point. Saying the universe was designed by some unknown designer using unknown means, unknown methods, and unknown materials for reasons unknown leaves everything unknown. It does not explain anything. It does not expand our understanding. It does not give us any kind of grasp at all on the question at hand. It answers nothing. Hence, an explanation that is itself inexplicable is not the best explanation. It is not a valid explanation. It's no explanation at all. As Craig will go on to say, requiring such a standard will immediately lead you into an infinite regress of explanations so that you could never even recognize a given explanation as the best, which would destroy science. Craig's attempt to appeal to an infinite regress here very subtly begs a serious, major question in epistemology. He is assuming, as are you, a foundationalist epistemology. That is, all knowledge must ultimately, ultimately be justified in terms of some fundamental, rationally indubitable base in order to pre uh, prevent an infinite regress. Now, you guys are in good company historically here with such an epistemology. Plato, Rene Descartes, Immanuel Kant, and well, pretty much all philosophers through the 18th and most of the 19th century used such an epistemology unquestioningly. But foundationalist epistemologies really fell out of favor in the latter half of the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the work of thinkers like Friedrich Nietzsche, Willard Van Orman Quine, Thomas Kuhn, just to name a few, eviscerated foundationalist epistemologies using a whole host of very technical arguments that I don't have time to get into right now. But suffice to say, such epistemologies cause way too many problems. Foundationalist approaches are not generally used by contemporary philosophers of science. And for that matter, they're not even used in mathematics anymore, ever since Kurt Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. The alternative to a foundationalist epistemology is a coherentist epistemology. In such a system, beliefs are justified not by ultimately being grounded in some indubitable base, but rather by fitting well with all of our other beliefs. When a new idea is proposed and it's in conflict with other beliefs that we have, we've got good reason to reject it. If many other ideas start to support the new idea, we have reason to rethink our assumptions. Maybe it was our other beliefs that were wrong, not the new idea. If enough support for the new idea is garnered, we have to reevaluate our web of beliefs, to use Quine's term. Uh, no one idea or even set of ideas is immune to such reevaluation. Now, this is a very rudimentary sketch, but I hope it gets the basic idea across. And I don't doubt you have many objections to this kind of epistemology, but before you voice them, I want to point out two things. First, epistemologists have been vigorously debating this for over a hundred years now. 
I'm pretty confident that any objections that spring to your mind have already been asked and answered. Second, even if coherent epistemologies are wrong, and by no means, I don't mean to suggest that they're universally accepted or that no contemporary philosophers uh, take foundationalist epistemologies, that, that's not true and I don't mean to imply that, but if nothing else, they are highly respected and a considerable force in a debate like this one. So it's naive of you to say that Craig is right and uh, I don't even know why this is argued. Craig has simply assumed a foundationalist epistemology without even considering the alternatives. And you are using that same unargued for epistemology to rebut Das American Atheist. Now, to apply this to the who designed the designer question, to appeal to God as a designer of the universe is only an explanation uh, of the universe if we have a good understanding of God. That is to say that if the God hypothesis fits with everything else we understand about the world. In the Middle Ages, I suppose, that we did have an understanding of uh, the world in general that would have fit with the God hypothesis, and in such an epistemic context, that hypothesis probably would have been justified. But once you add in the last thousand years of history, including things like the Reformation, the rise of modern science, the development of modern cosmology, the recognition of the diversity and plurality of world religions, the factioning and sub-factioning of the monotheistic religions, we as a society no longer have a clear univocal understanding of God. In order for God to be an explanation, we need to see how he fits into everything else we understand about the world. In order to do that, we need details. That's really what we're looking for when we ask who designed the designer. Details of how this designer fits into our web of beliefs. VBFL920 uh, said, what's your explanation then of the Big Bang? if this is your view. But I'll go further and ask, what's the explanation of that explanation, James? Um, the Big Bang can't be the best explanation until you can explain its explanation. Oh, and when you're done with that, what's the explanation of that explanation? Because I'm not going to accept that as the best explanation until I have an explanation for that too. I mean, you can see how this is foolish. It would just go on and on ad infinitum. I hope you can see why the question, what explains the Big Bang, is the wrong question at this point. You're treating explanation as if it were synonymous with cause, which it's not. Causes are one form of explanation because pointing to a cause caches up something we don't understand in terms of both an effect and a set of background conditions, which presumably we do understand. That is to say, when a causal explanation works, it works because it shows how the thing explained fits into our web of beliefs. But causes are not the only form of explanation. If you ask, what caused the Big Bang, you're asking a nonsense question. By definition, nothing can cause the Big Bang, since all causes take place in space-time, and the Big Bang was the beginning of space-time. Asking what caused the Big Bang is like asking what's north of the North Pole. But even though the question of what caused the Big Bang is meaningless, that does not mean the Big Bang is inexplicable. Ask an astrophysicist to explain the Big Bang, and she'll talk your ear off. She'll provide you with mountains and mountains of evidence, and then more evidence. Failed attempts to disprove the theory. Problems in other branches of physics that the Big Bang theory illuminates, etc. and so forth. The Big Bang fits embarrassingly well into our current web of beliefs. Because, James, if it's downright necessary to have an explanation of the explanation in order to recognize it as the best, then you can literally keep asking the question forever, and you will have never in fact made the recognition of a best explanation. That should be patently obvious. So yes, this would destroy science as an enterprise, absolutely. I again hope you can see the problem with this argument here. Asking what's the best explanation in science, or in any field for that matter, is not asking to be led back to some fundamental explanation that grounds it all. The best explanation is the one that fits best with our current web of beliefs. This is how science works, both in theory and in practice. I'm running out of time here, so let me sum up. William Lane Craig, and you, Veritas, have secretly presupposed a very controversial epistemology that is rejected by most contemporary epistemologists and philosophers of science. Once that epistemology is replaced by a coherentist epistemology, it becomes clear why God done it is not the best explanation. It is, in fact, no explanation at all. At the same time, 
scientific explanations still hold because we can give detailed accounts that fit together very well in our web of beliefs.